Good evening. Um, yep, many thanks to uh, Tim for that introduction. That covers my, most, my first slide, really. I'm Anthony Furhan, Director of Fjord Limited, a, a very small uh, marine archaeological consultancy. I'm very grateful to have been invited by the Royal Archaeological Institute to talk to you about uh, the work that I've been doing work that I've been carrying out for Historic England on the East Coast War Channels in the First World War. Now, February 2017, this month, marks the centenary of the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare uh, by Germany. This offensive was a, a turning point in the war, presenting a greater threat to Britain than perhaps any of the other of the offensives on land. It was a desperate ploy, uh, leading directly, as the Germans anticipated, to the Uni United States joining the conflict. Allowing U-boats to attack any vessel without warning was brutal and effective, at least initially. This particular centenary is a very appropriate point to be considering the U-boat war and the First World War at sea more generally. One of the paradoxes of the First World War is that so much of the conflict, the attrition, the vast loss of life took place on land, while so many of the causes, key tur turning points, and the decisive end arose from the maritime sphere. With so many people killed in warfare on land, it is completely understandable that public memory is focused on this aspect of the war, on the Western Front, Ypres, the Somme, Passchendaele, Gallipoli. The war at sea killed far less, but sheer weight of numbers is not the only basis for directing our efforts, whether it be in terms of research, public awareness, or conservation. The conflict at sea is central to understanding the First World War and its effects on UK society, yet it's largely forgotten beyond the fairly narrow band of historians. And even for these historians, the focus seems repeatedly drawn to just a few events. This uh, photograph here shows um, from the National Archives, shows the, um, the Queen Mary, a battle cruiser, uh, exploding at the Battle of Jutland. Um, 1,266 people killed in that instant there. And it, Jutland, as you'll have probably seen last year for its centenary, continues to, to uh, take a, an awful lot of attention uh, in, the, in the marine sphere as far as the First World War is concerned. But in this lecture, I want to examine a facet of the war at sea that is almost entirely forgotten, namely the struggle between Britain and Germany over the East Coast War Channels. All along the edge of the North Sea, from 19, August 1914 through to November 1918, so for the full duration of the war, the front line ran along the coast of Britain. The Western Front, which we normally think of as extending from Switzerland to the Belgian coast, actually carried on beyond this point, crossing the Southern North Sea to the coast of Kent, then north across the Thames to hug the coast of Essex and Suffolk, across the Wash to the Humber, along the coast of Yorkshire in the northeast, up to the Firth of Forth, then on along Scotland's east coast to Orkney. No man's land started at low water. German ships and U-boats came right in shore. This was not simply a home front, the East Coast was host to a hot war of high explosives, shells, bullets, and death. Now we think of sometimes, there's been quite a lot of uh, attention directed to the Zeppelin raids uh, and the uh, Gotha raids, but there was really a handful of those, 50 in total, about 50 in total, um, very kind of sporadic. Um, they, they really pale into insignificance compared to the, the constant attrition that was happening on the East Coast in the marine sphere immediately offshore. I just want to um, make that point with this. Uh, th this is um, North Bay Scarborough, and the, the uh, red uh, circle there is the, the approximate location of a, a wreck, um, a ship called the Madame René, it's uh, a cargo ship. That was um, torpedoed on the 10th of August in 1918 on passage uh, from London to the Tyne. 10 men killed, and it's about a mile uh, from Scorby Ness, which is uh, this uh, this point here. Um, it was torpedoed on the port side from inshore to give you an idea of how close inshore the German U boats were working. That makes sense uh, in that they were probably able to see it was, it was torpedoed in the morning. They probably used the silhouette against the, uh, the morning light uh, both to show up the, the ship but also to, to hide the U boat. So this was really very close inshore, the, the, the front line was easily visible uh, within, uh, w from, the, from the promenade, really. History has not served the East Coast War Channels very well. 
After a few references in contemporary accounts from the 1920s and 30s, it's barely mentioned. It was very clear at the time to the people who were either working in the East Coast or, or aware of it through the public, it, was, it had high profile then, but that profile uh, has fallen away. Th and there's a, I like this quote here, this is from a, um, an aviator, uh, an airman working from out of Felixstowe, uh, who gives a, a sense of the, um, the, the shipping channel running parallel with the coast. Here, as far as the eye could see in either direction, was a thick stream of cargo boats of all shapes and sizes, plowing along their various occasions, a striking example of the might of the British mercantile marine. So this current centenary has um, prompted uh, a new uh, archaeological approach to the war channels and I, I think a, an archaeological perspective is, a, is appropriate because the war channels really are best understood as a, as a physical feature uh, of the marine historic environment. Um, there's a, if you like, it was a a trail that was made through all of those boats passing by, but it also had other material aspects uh, that I'm going to talk about. Although though the sites that make up the war channel can be considered individually, indeed this is how they're tended to be viewed, so people talk about this wreck or that wreck, um, it's through considering the war channels as an archaeological landscape that these sites take on their full meaning and significance. The war channels have a research value that arises from the physical remains as well as from the documentary record. But in addition to this research value, an archaeological approach prompts us to consider the future, uh, the future conservation of the physical remains and to seek ways to engage the public uh, in better um, understanding, appreciating the historic events that occurred in seemingly familiar coastal places. So the thought that this is um, up on the North Yorkshire coast on the coastal path um, lots of people use the coastal path, lots of people visit that coast. The sense that the First World War had a material effect immediately offshore, easily within that view, is um, largely unknown to most people. The War Channels present a designed, defensive landscape on a scale commensurate with the First Total War. The War Channels are perhaps the largest single defensive structure ever to have been created in Britain but you won't find them in many records. At its most basic, the war channels are a series of marked routes for ships to follow. The main cha channel provided a spine that ran from North Holland in Kent to the Firth of Forth, from which channels ran landward into the East Coast ports and seaward towards the Netherlands, the Baltic, Scandinavia, and around Scotland to the Atlantic. Just uh, give you, I'm not sure, if that might be too light, but if you can follow the arrow. You can see the, the line of the War Channel heading up north. The War Channels were created in August 1914, so right at the very start of the war. Um, on, even before Germany declared war, um, a mine layer was en route to the east coast, uh, a ship called the Koenig and Louise. Um, to lay mines uh, roughly uh, in, in, this, in this area. And, and they were laid straight across the shipping channel. Now, at that stage, the German intent was probably to uh, trap British warships rather than merchant vessels. But mines are indiscriminate, and it was uh, merchant vessels and fishing boats that were the, the first casualties. Further mines were then laid off Harwich, um, the Tyne, so here we go, the Harwich Field, uh, off the Tyne, uh, uh, and off the Humber. And the Admiralty, this was in the, the opening weeks of the war, really, the Admiralty decided that they just couldn't afford the resources to try and sweep up those minefields. It was too large a job, too imprecise, too inexact. So they decided instead to clear a single channel, which is, which is what becomes the war channel. And then all the effort was focused on keeping that channel clear. The war channels were marked by a, a series of buoys, uh, so it was physically marked all the way up. So you, again, you can see it there going up off the, the coast of North Yorkshire around Flamborough Head, and up towards the Tees. And in this little inset here, you can see the centre line buoys um, with uh, the letters on them, identification letters on them. And the, uh, the channel, so that, that those buoys formed the centre line. And the channel was swept to a width of one mile, so half a mile either side of that centre line. 
and ships were to keep the boys on the port left hand side uh, at a distance of two cables, so about 400 yards, 370 metres. Taken as a whole, the war, war channels become the dominant feature that structures the war at sea on the east coast, especially in respect of cargo ships, the minor warships that sought to protect them, and fishing vessels. Mines were the principal weapon in terms of numbers, uh, numbers of ships sunk, uh, laid initially by surface vessels, but later by mine-laying U-boats. Uh, the channels appear to have been swept daily, involving a huge operational, log operational logistical and administrative effort. And that's one of the, the, uh, the, the most impressive things, um, and the, the thing to be more borne in mind, and I think it does make you think more broadly in archaeological terms, it, it's not just the physical thing, it's what the physical thing represents in terms of the amount of effort. And, and people were literally sweeping the whole of that route each day throughout the four years of the war. A tremendous uh, level of uh, um, uh, investment, if you like, uh, 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 of effort. So that the um, this is uh, one of the um, mines here from the uh, the minefield off uh, Scarborough. As the channels were swept, so they became the focus for further mine laying, and for attacks in other forms. So shelling by U-boats on the surface, they would surface and, 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 and fire their guns. Um, they would put. The, they would surface, send their crews across to the ships to lay explosives, uh, open the seacocks and sink ships that way, uh, and also they would fire torpedoes. Over a thousand ships were sunk on the east coast during the First World War, and it's this assemblage that is the most marked physical expression of the war channels. Unlike most battlefields on land, these wrecked ships still stand on the seafloor, becoming newly visible through advances in marine surveying. In the remainder of this paper, I want to look at the, uh, the war channels in, in terms of uh, its broader context, uh, some key themes, uh, the surviving material record, some ways in which I think the war channels uh, challenge uh, our histories of the First World War. And I want to finish uh, by saying a little bit, bit about how this project for Historic England is being carried out. So to start in terms of broader context, so the battle over the war channels was a part of a broader attempt by Germany to blockade uh, maritime trade uh, to and from Great Britain. Um, so the, uh, on the uh, right hand side here you can see the, this is the area declared, so where the Germany said it would sink anything that it saw, in effect, uh, to uh, uh, create a, an entire blockade uh, around um, um, the UK, uh, and, the, and, and here's a, a poster, a propaganda poster, which says the work of our U-boats um, shows all the trade going into London across the North Sea uh, before the U-boats and all the boats being held in port uh, by the U-boats afterwards. So they're, they're, that's very clear intent. Um, yes, it was really a, a, a blockade uh, to uh, a stranglehold on trade uh, was the intent. Now it's important to examine the U-boat war in the Atlantic, in the Western approaches, which is where the attention tends to be focused. But it's also important to consider the U-boat war in the North Sea, centred on the war channels. And as I say, this is what tends to get forgot forgotten. You will struggle in any maritime history uh, of the First World War to find much of an account of the U-boat war in the North Sea. It's just uh, as if it did never happened. Another aspect of this broader context, though, is that is the, the British blockade of German trade. Uh, the U-boat blockade um, was being matched, again, from the very, well, perhaps even more promptly from the very start of the war by a British blockade of German ports. Uh, and rather than a, a close blockade, which is, so blockade is traditionally what Britain does uh, in Napoleonic Wars. In every case, it uses its... Uh, is overpowering um, uh, strength in surface warships to stop the enemy from trading. And they, that was the, 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 the intent at the outset of the, of the First World War. Also, Britain put in place a maritime blockade, but rather than putting it in a, a close blockade, close to the German ports, they put in a, a distant blockade, which focused up around um, uh, the Atlantic, around the, the Northern Isles in, in Scotland. So 
in, on this map here. So I've lost the mouse. I know, here we go. So here, here we've got um, Orkney and Shetland, and you can see where the, the majority of uh, uh, arrests are occurring. So British ships, um, uh, cruisers, uh, would uh, stop the German uh, stop ships and, and see what they were carrying. If they were suspected of trading with Germany, then they'd be arrested. And that blockade was hugely effective, and it has to be said, hugely lethal also. It's estimated it had a crippling effect on Germany's domestic situation, and it's thought to have caused over 400,000 deaths from malnutrition. So it's important to th when you hear about the U-boat war, and yes, that involved tremendous loss of life, but there was also a British blockade happening at the same time, which also resulted in huge loss of life, except it wasn't happening at sea, that the loss of life was occurring uh, uh, in Germany itself. Another aspect of this broader context is the use of cruisers, cr um, commerce raiding. Again, it's a very traditional approach to conducting war at sea is to uh, stop and attack uh, the, enemy, um, the enemy's merchant ships, um, to take them prize, uh, capture them, and that's entirely legitimate. And, and indeed, Germany set off to do that with its own cruisers at the early, early stage of the war. Britain responded by putting a huge amount of effort in very early parts of uh, the First World War into to tracking down uh, the German cruisers, commerce raiders, uh, and stopping them, which, uh, which they, they quickly did. Um, the, and the first use to, some of the first use of U-boats has to be seen in the context of commerce raiding. So it's doing the same thing as cruisers were doing, stopping merchant ships in order to uh, arrest them. The problem with uh, U-boats is that once they're on the surface, they're hugely vulnerable. They're also not able to uh, take on board the crew from the, um, uh, from the captured ship. And um, they can't really take the vessel as a prize either. They can't keep it afloat. So it's a relatively short step uh, to take to require the crews, uh, that the, the crews, the captured crews, if you like, to take to their own boats uh, and then for ships to be sunk rather than captured. And really the, the initial use of U-boats is, is very much in the vein of cruiser warfare. Uh, it's a, a reasonably quick and logical extension of uh, a very traditional practice. <coughs> the last point I want to make about this broader context is the interplay between uh, the commerce war, uh, which, in which U-boats were involved, uh, and, and fleet actions. So uh, much of the focus in the North Sea was over the, uh, the, the, the wish for, by both sides to bring each other's big fleets to bear on each other and to, to have one big battle which would uh, resolve the course of the war. Um, and new boats were originally conceived of in that context. So German new boats, first, uh, their first role was really against um, warships. They were used, again, quite... Uh, uh, surprisingly successfully uh, in, a, in a series of attacks on, uh, on ships, the uh, Pathfinder, the three cruisers, um, uh, Abu Kia, Cressy and Hogue, uh, and the, the battleship Audacious. Um, and that was the, the submarines uh, attacking warships was uh, really how they started. But they were switched against merchant shipping uh, and started to make successes there. Then they were switched back to being used <coughs> with the German fleet so the idea being that the German fleet would lure the British fleet over lines of um, U-boats uh, and cause the British fleet to be, be sunk by those U-boats. And that's what uh, the, the picture here is a, is a cruiser, a British cruiser called Falmouth. That's one of two cruisers lost in the uh, middle of 1916, August 1916, where exactly that happened. Germany was able to lure those ships uh, over its lines, some, some lines of U-boats uh, that it had already put in place, uh, and, and they managed a... Uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of wins there. And that was so effective in a sense that after that point, Britain never sent major ships into the Southern North Sea just because the danger to those ships from U-boats uh, was so intense. Move on to some key themes about the war channels. So it's mostly a conflict involving civilians on the side of Britain and uh, neutrals. 
um, they're, they're, they're the main uh, focus. So these are seamen, seafarers, on the, quite often on the British register or, or, or attached to a foreign registers of neutral powers. I can't say how many people were killed uh, in the East Coast because those, those kinds of numbers are, are not easy to, to determine. But I've just included here a little section which gives you a sense of the proportion. So that's the uh, overall losses in the Royal Navy, 24,000. 13,000 in mercantile marine, um, and then uh, losses also to the reserve forces, and they're really effectively civilians, uh, only very slightly removed. So you can see there quite a very high impact on uh, on civilians who have not 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 service any uh, at all. Sometimes people talk about the merchant navy as if it's a a, a branch, a kind of a military branch or quasi military branch. The merchant navy didn't really exist at, at this point. It's only coined as a phrase subsequent to the First World War. These are simply uh, registered seamen. The merchant seamen and the fishermen who died off the East Coast uh, and have no grave but the sea are commemorated at Tower Hill in London, so the uh, Tower Hill Memorial, um, which is just opposite the tower, but very close to the tube station. Um, but also, uh, not only from the East Coast there, but from, from every, every theatre, really. Uh, and a long way from the places where they served and died. died. And it, it's a striking monument, uh, certainly worth visiting. All the vessels are listed with their crews, um, but it provides no indication of where those vessels were lost. And, and it, you feel that they're somewhat themselves lost in the centre of London, uh, very far from uh, where they actually served. Another key theme of the War Channels is that it, it's, an awful lot of it is about coal. It's about coal being transported from the northeast to London, to the southeast, uh, and to France. And that's coal for, obviously, for, for heating, but uh, for electricity also, and for gas. So this is, uh, this is a, effectively an oil pipeline, pre-oil. It's really important that coal continues to flow from the northeast uh, down to the south. And you'll see uh, here on the, the diagram, that, um, half the ships are either carrying coal or they're in ballast, empty, going back to get more coal. Um, and as I say, quite a lot of the ships are going to France because France lost access to its own coal fields in the very opening phases of the First World War when, when Germany invaded through uh, northern France and Belgium. So France itself was... Um, very dependent on northeast coal as well. Another key theme is the um, shipbuilding. Many of the ships sunk on the east coast uh, are lost relatively close to where they were built, and this reflects the, the dominance of northeast shipbuilding uh, in the merchant fleet at the time, so particularly the, 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 the Tyne uh, and the Weir. Shipbuilding and repair, especially in the Tyne, Weir, Tees and Humber, were hugely important during the war to make good the enormous losses that were being sustained on the East Coast and in other theatres. And this uh, slide's uh, from a, another piece of work that I've been doing, looking at a particular uh, group of wrecks uh, off, off the Tees. Um, and you can see there, these, these are where's the, here we go. Um, just a, a list of the uh, wrecks uh, along the bottom, and these bars represent the point at which they were built uh, and uh, the point at which they were sunk, they were lost. And you'll see that the, uh, the First World War and that band there absolutely cuts a swathe through uh, shipping. And to a lesser extent, it's the same in the Second World War, but really in the, in the First World War, you'll see all those ships coming to an end, uh, being uh, uh, sunk before their time. So the, uh, the War Channels provide this time slice uh, across Britain's shipbuilding heritage. And it's worth noting that this heritage, hugely important to the economy and society of the UK in the uh, 19th, early 20th century, and it's not been well conserved. There are very few ships in preservation of this size, of a kind of proper steamship size. Um, and most of the onshore heritage of shipbuilding in, in civilian yards that has been completely erased. You, you, it's not there, other than relatively few uh, designated uh, 
uh, monuments, are of, but really uh, only a handful. Consequently, the First World War wrecks underwater provide an absolutely key resource in terms of our shipping heritage. Um, and again, one of the areas where I think they're, they're, they're of tremendous importance in terms of their future conservation, uh, but also our, our continued understanding of the, the, the massive technological changes that were going happening at that time, which were themselves fundamental uh, to Britain's position in the world. Another key theme is the, uh, the new technologies that were being developed and used in the, uh, on the East Coast, uh, flagging here in particular wireless, really important in the First World War, uh, and with that, um, intelligence. That's intercepting messages from the U-boats, but also using uh, transmissions by U-boats to calculate their position. Um, so, uh, and, and then working that intelligence into a, uh, into, a, into a response. The use of air power, again, really important in the First World War. Um, we tend to think of, if we do at all, of the Royal Naval Air Service, um, their stations as being a kind of a, a, a training grounds before sending people off to fight the Red Baron or something like that. But actually there was really heavy use of aircraft specifically uh, in an anti-submarine uh, role. Uh, and again, very important. They used, they used um, not only land planes, but sea planes and, uh, and airships, very heavy use of airships. Um, and the, the other one, I uh, think this, this little group here, these are, are motorboats. So it's uh, something, again, we tend to associate with the, first world, uh, with the Second World War more than the first is the use of um, small craft uh, to, uh, as a small armed craft. It really, again, has its roots uh, in the First World War. And a final theme that I want to just flag is the, um, the, the importance of organisation and administration. So we tend to think about total war in terms of the industrialisation of, of warfare, but also the industrialisation of production. One of the key aspects, I think, of the First World War that's really flagged by these Coast War channels is is bureaucratization, if you like. And that, that's really, uh, in some respects, a key to Britain's success. It's not just being able to uh, create lots of weaponry, lots and lots of shells. It's also uh, mobilized swathes of the population, but it's also organizing it and administering it. Now that on the, sounds a bit of an odd aspect of the war, but I think it really is fundamental uh, to um, the success of, of making a system as complex as the war channels uh, continue to work. One of the plus sides of that is that there's a tremendous, uh, uh, there's a mass of files in the National Archives and elsewhere which uh, gives you this, these streams of information which have been, you know, a fraction of which have been uh, kept and which we can now investigate. Um, but on the other hand, it's difficult to say, well, it doesn't really have a material, an archaeological aspect. That's just really, you know, uh, you, know you can't really, what's the archaeology of bureaucracy? Um, and, and this example was actually flagged to me by, uh, by a colleague. This is um, St. James's Park, which you can find Buckingham Palace at the back of Whitehall. You see in there where the lake should be, there are in fact a whole series of temporary buildings. Now there is not a sign of those. When I, when I saw this photograph and saw these, uh, these buildings, I thought, well, they, sh they might just be in the lake still. What, you know, what an amazing piece of underwater archaeology that would be. So I went and peered in the water. I think they absolutely erased them. And maybe that was a condition. You, you, you build in the park, it all goes. But yes, to, to, to think, here's, if you like, these are the Ministry of Shipping. It's a, a material manifestation of the vast increase in civil servants that was required and to, to, to administer the war. And, uh, um, and, and yes, and, and, and it's, a, if you like, a material manifestation of uh, total bureaucracy in the First World War. Absolutely critical. Right, material record. So I just wanted to run through the kinds of ships uh, that, that, that are out there. Uh, and wrecks. So cargo ships are the main component. Uh, literally hundreds <coughs> uh, of cargo ships, uh, in, in, as, as you can see here, fairly close in shore, uh, stretching up the east coast. Generally speaking, relatively small ships, 
um, but of the absolute bread and butter of maritime trade. And this, uh, this middle picture gives you an indication of what a, of a wreck can uh, look like on the seabed uh, with a, uh, in, uh, using uh, some modern surveying uh, technology. Uh, each, each of these stories, uh, each of these ships has a story. Well, I'm going to uh, keep moving on. Fishing vessels. Um, again, a lot of fishing vessels, they were, they were specifically targeted uh, by the U-boats to uh, um, really to damage the, um, uh, the, the capacity to um, you know, create food. Uh, and so very whole fleets of fishing vessels were taken out. They were very specifically targeted. This is a photograph of a, um, uh, the, the, the crew on the front deck of UB39, um, and they're, they're watching out of shot uh, their ship uh, being sunk, and then they would then be put into, uh, into the boats and uh, allow, uh, made to fend for themselves, really. See, I, I like this photograph because of the uh, see the, the young lad there. Um, you know, this was uh, all pretty indiscriminate. Very few large warships are sunk on the east coast during the First World War, but a very large number of small warships, minor warships, are sunk, and they're either small ships like destroyers, but most commonly they're requisitioned craft, like the, uh, this is a, the steam yacht, this is a, a, a pleasure yacht, which was requisitioned and, uh, uh, and used for, as a patrol ship. So the, the, the Mekong, which uh, is, is wrecked close to Filey Brig. Uh, and then uh, here we have the, the other type of ship that was requisitioned in vast quantities is, is, uh, is fishing boats, trawlers particularly which were used for, um, uh, as for minesweepers, uh, but also as, as for patrol boats. Now, minesweeping with, with a trawl, it's, it's, not a, it's not a very technical exercise. You literally put uh, a sweep of uh, cable between two trawlers and you go through the mines. And you hope that in doing so, you will make the mines pop to the surface, but it's hugely hazardous. You're going into minefields with, with a pair of, sh of boats, and the, the numbers lost were huge. And when a, uh, a trawler hits a mine, it disappears. It, they sink very, very quickly with, with complete loss of life. So it's a, a hugely, um, uh, huge numbers of trawlers lost with, lost with, with, with all their crews, uh, often with all their crews. Um, wrecks are not found only underwater. This is a, uh, a hulked boat at Isleworth uh, on the Thames, and it's a uh, a motor launch. This is one of the the little boats that I was talking about before. Quite again, quite a uh, an innovative um, type of boat. They were mass produce produced like production line approach uh, in in America in Canada, and they and they were shipped over on the decks of cargo ships to be used uh, around Britain, and they were used in a, a tremendous variety of roles. They're known as submarine chasers, uh, specifically they had a, a depth charge uh, uh, and a gun and they were there to, to chase submarines. Uh, 550 were, were made, as I say, with mass production methods. This, we think, is the only surviving example, uh, as I say, took to, uh, in, a, an old shipyard, uh, in a shipyard in, uh, in Isleworth on the Thames. And the um, Thames Discovery Programme, uh, once, once I've flagged the possibility that this might still be there, um, They've, they've been doing some recording work with volunteers. Uh, and a tremendously um, important boat. Um, um, not in a good way, though. It's very difficult. When you uh, mentioned conservation a few times, trying to think of a suitable solution for a, 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 a boat which is not really in the archaeological record, but is well past the possibility of preservation, it does create some tremendous problems trying to think, well, what might be a good future for, for what is a, is a unique vessel? U-boats were also victims on the East Coast. Uh, again, quite large numbers, about 30-odd U-boats sunk on the East Coast. The, um, 
you can see the, the, the where they're sunk uh, on, on the left there. This is a, uh, an example of a UB-75, which is uh, off the North Yorkshire coast, off Robin Hood's Bay, uh, broken in two. I don't know whether you can make this out, but so this is a position of UB-75 here uh, near UB-41. Now, one of the things that the Royal Navy did was to lay uh, mine traps for the U-boat. So they would they the, the Navy themselves uh, planted mines on the East Coast, but they planted them at a depth that was too deep to uh, hit a merchant ship, and, but specifically to get uh, as a trap against the U-boats. This you can see this trap. Th th these these lines here, which show where they were where they were laid. It has the date there. You probably can't make that out, but that's September 1917, uh, and, and these two um, U-boats were sunk in October and December 1917, and they would have just disappeared. It, the people who laid the mines here would not have known that they'd been successful, so successful in fact. These were only discovered by divers uh, relatively recently. Um, it's actually U-boats which tend to have the highest loss of life of any individual vessel uh, on, uh, on, the, um, on the East Coast War Channels. You don't tend to get massive loss of life because the vessels are usually fairly small with fairly small crews. But when a U-boat is sunk, it, it's pretty catastrophic for the whole crew and they tend to all go. What I've done here is just graph the, uh, the, the number of ships lost over the course of the war, um, split down into cargo, fishing and, and warship vessels. I'm going to be pressed for time, so I won't go into this uh, in any detail. What I've done there, though, is to, is to flag the things that were happening in the uh, in that broader context, to just to illustrate the point that there's a quite a close relationship between the material record and these broader changes that are occurring, uh, changes in, in strategy, uh, individual events, uh, and so on. And you can see there how this very concentrated uh, targeting of fishing boats uh, in the summer of uh, 1915, and again uh, in the summer of 1916, very specific targeted com campaigns at those points. Looks like the same happening in the summer of 1918 too. So it's not a, a, a tale of kind of a continuous attrition. What's happening is very episodic uh, and, and tied to these, these broader patterns. Just to elaborate this uh, chronological aspect of the War Channels uh, a little more, you can also see changes in, um, here I, I flagged um, the cause of loss between mines in blue uh, and torpedoes, and here I've looked at tonnage rather than straight numbers. And you see that, that how important mines were for the bulk of the war. It's really losses caused by mines uh, that are the main issue. Uh, but in from um, summer uh, 1917, much greater use of torpedoes. Uh, this is in the period where uh, unrestricted warfare, they, they will attack without warning. Uh, and torpedoes are uh, ideal for that. And there's a, a, a geographical aspect to it too. Again, the, the, this, this landscape changes. It has different aspects in different places. So I've just, this is most easily shown by comparing the, the cargo ships lost in 1916 with cargo ships lost in 1917. And you can see on the, on the 1916, big uh, concentrations are, are down on the, uh, the Suffolk uh, and Essex coast. Um, whereas in, in 1917, the, F, uh, the losses are really occurring up on the uh, North Yorkshire, northeast coast. So there are real, uh, real changes in the, in the geographical distribution uh, of what's happening. This one's probably going to be a bit dim, but again, this just really flags the fact that the, the war channel itself was, was, was moved around. Um, here we've got it. Uh, this is probably, it's, a, it's an admiralty chart, so it's not, if you're not used to looking at them, they're, they're, they're not the most easy to read. But this is off um, um, the channel going off the um, off the Thames in the outer Thames and being subsequently moved right in shore. And it says here, "Do not use this channel." And in fact, passage along this line of buoys is prohibited because it's presumably become so uh, uh, so problematic for attacks. So there are changes occurring in that landscape over time. There's also quite a fine scale of geography as you as you drill down into it. These are the, these are individual lays of mines by German submarines off uh, the off uh, Ness really, 
uh, and uh, there, this, these are from documents captured after the war, which show the um, the number of mines laid uh, and the date uh, on which U-boats uh, laid them. So there's a tremendous density of, uh, of data available, so you can really start to break down these uh, these big patterns into uh, much smaller landscapes. Moving on to the material. Uh, other aspects of the material record is the um, other types of sites. So one thing that I'm really quite interested, I've not seen any real evidence for it yet, but there's no reason why that evidence shouldn't be there, is for the uh, um, the infrastructure of the channels themselves. That, that, the buoys, uh, some of which uh, would sink, the moorings for those buoys, mine sinkers, and also there's a lot of obstructions and nets placed out. So this, these are, give you an idea, This is these are obstructions and mines laid by the Royal Navy out in the uh, Outer Thames. And you'll see there's, uh, there's a whole layering up of uh, different kinds of uh, means of trying to sink uh, and prohibit U-boats. Um, and to give a, an idea, this is the, so this is the mine, this would have been the bit that was swept up. But underneath the mine, the mine sat on a kind of a trolley which dropped into the sea, uh, off, uh, off the back of the boat in this case, went down to the seabed, and then automatically unraveled the cable which would leave the mines suspended uh, in the water above it. So whereas the mine would have been swept, there were literally thousands of these trolleys must be on, still on the seabed, uh, marking out uh, where, the, uh, where the mines were laid. There was an onshore component to this too. There was a whole series of different uh, buildings, facilities made on shore to keep uh, track of the war channels, war watching stations, signal stations, uh, <coughs> and wireless, wireless stations. Um, so again, the, the, all of these form part of that, uh, the, uh, the heritage assets, the onshore heritage assets of, the, uh, of that landscape. Some of them survive surprisingly well. So this here is a, a wartime photograph of a RNAS station at uh, Seaton Crew, just on the inside of the, uh, the Tees. You can see it's got a, a breakwater and a, um, and a slipway. And if you look on Google or Bing, you can see that the breakwater and the slipway still survive. Now, th this seems to me fairly remarkable that you've got these survivals of First war World War uh, infrastructure, which was only made to last uh, you know, a very short time, but it's still there surviving. And there's quite a few of these instances of, particularly of um, uh, air stations where they have elements going into the water and they, they, they still survive in the intersidal area. And the other, th just to touch again on, on aircraft, you would, might think that the aircraft of the time were so flimsy, so tiny, um, that nothing would survive of them. But there are instances of some of the heavier bits at least being turning up in, in fishing nets and so on. So this is a uh, a, a clergé engine uh, which would have gone in the front of one of these type of uh, uh, float planes um, uh, and yes and, and surviving and, and coming up so there, there, there are these instances of uh, First World War aircraft remains turning up in the uh, in the North Sea also right there are a couple of ways in which I think the war channels challenge our ideas of uh, our history this is a a, a grave in Whitby. Uh, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see that. There. Okay, maybe it shows. So this is the uh, um, fireman Said and fireman Hamid. There, the uh, the seafarers on in the war channels were a diverse lot. It's quite. It's difficult to get numbers on this, but certainly there were. Asian seafarers, Muslim seafarers, black seafarers um, on the East Coast. Again, people might not think of that. I think that there's a, if you do think of, now, there's a lot of uh, black and ethnic uh, and Asian seafarers um, uh, at the time, but I think people tend to think of them as being somewhere else um, on the oceans of the world, on the ocean liners. But there's definitely a domestic coastwise shipping there are uh, there's a real diversity uh, of uh, crews involved so the idea that you've got two Muslim seafarers in a grave in Whitby I think is um, surprising to a lot of people and it really shouldn't be so just to this is the um, they're off the Hercules they were um, they came ashore they were washed ashore they died uh, came ashore on the beach 
the, initially the record says two Arabs and then it's crossed out with their names Hamid and Said and then they're bur buried uh, in Whitby and you can see that this is the war graves uh, list of the people aboard and it, there's, there's Said down here, Hamid up here but it also is it's Kyopolis, Ky Ky Kylimbus there's a range of um, uh, people represented are on those crews so when you talk about the First World War being a world war it was a world war on the east coast only uh, also it's, uh, it's certainly not uh, a parochial history this is the um, sort of story with the Audax uh, here and again this illustrates another interesting aspect of uh, how different people are treated the, so three people killed on the Audax, uh, Johansson, he's, he's a Swede, and he's commemorated at, uh, at Tower Hill. And you can see there you go, there's Audax, this is the plaque at Tower Hill, and Johansson. Now, his crewmates, Gauss Mohammed, Mohammed Abdul, they were members of the Indian Merchant Service. So they're not at Tower Hill, they're commemorated in Mumbai. So um, it's kind of bizarre that you're, you, you have people being commemorated in, in different places. And, and to be commemorated in Mumbai, where actually you, you ended your days somewhere off Whitby, is again, seems a bit odd, seems a bit bizarre. Um, again, in both these cases, um, it's unfortunate that the war graves uh, records tend to include a reasonable amount of information about uh, British and European sailors uh, they'll have next of kin uh, and some details, uh, as you'll see here. Um, for um, Muslim seafarers, Asian seafarers, Chinese seafarers, there's virtually nothing but their names and their rank. So uh, a, a real uh, discrepancy in there, uh, and that makes it difficult to, to, to really take it very far. Just touch also on uh, women on the East Coast. So women are in a variety of roles in the Navy as uh, wrens, um, they're fulfilling kind of quasi-domestic roles, roles a bit like munition, munitionettes in this case, where they're, they're wiring up glass uh, floats to, um, from which um, anti-submarine nets could be suspended. And so that's what they're doing. So they're doing kind of, um, kind of semi-skilled, uh, uh, almost production line work. And that's how we tend to think of women in the First World War is in these kind of uh, either domestic roles, nursing roles, or munitionette type roles. But they're also involved in engineering, skilled and heavy engineering up in the Northeast. Again, that, these are not the kinds of images we tend to see or tend to associate with women. There's a really interesting thing about what's happen what happens with women in marine engineering and engineering generally and the First World War, because you do have quite large numbers uh, emphasis on taking them into skilled roles and then at the end of the war they are really are completely pushed back out so much so that the Women's Engineering Society uh, is set up to try and uh, uh, keep the flame alive and Women's Engineering Society, WES, still exists today encouraging uh, girls uh, into engineering but has it 1919 WES was set up and here we've got women doing some, again, this is not production line, but this is really pretty hard graft in terms of uh, physical labour. I hope you can make it out there. This is, they're, they're building a shipyard uh, on the Tees, and that's the Tees tra transporter bridge just there in the background. And this is the, that shipyard today. It's Haverton Hill, so it was built as an emergency shipyard uh, towards the end of the First World War on the Tees. Um, th those are the, uh, the slips and basins uh, constructed by those women that went on to be uh, used as a shipbuilding yard all the way through into, um, into the 70s, part of Swan Hunters and um, it's gone through a few owners uh, obviously shipbuilding in, in, in the northeast was utterly hammered um, I think it was in use through till the uh, 1970s uh, 78 I think with Swan Hunter but now that same place is being used for constructing wind farm components so again, I don't think many people in the area would realize quite how much female labor is embedded. You know, female labor from the First World War is embedded in that industrial landscape uh, on, on the Tees. 
Um, so maritime history and archaeology te tends to have a very heavy technical content. Um, but it's not just a technical subject, nor need it appeal only to the technically minded. Now, we're familiar with war artists uh, on the Western Front. I imagine not very many people know about the war artists who were sent to sea. Uh, and so uh, when you look into the, uh, the various archives, particularly held by the Imperial War Museum, who originally commissioned these kinds of things, uh, where the propaganda departments commissioned them, those went on into the Imperial War Museum collections, there's some fantastic uh, artistry uh, to do with the war at sea on the East Coast. Um, so these are, um, uh, as well as containing technical details, I mean, there's a, a great image of the bottom of one of those mo uh, most, most launches, MLs. But one of the things that you don't often see is the, is the faces uh, of the, the sailors on board. So there's very few photographs, actually, of, of the normal, normal crew, if you like. Quite a few admirals and things, but um, if you see the, the the crew in their quarters, and these are these are certainly not made up faces because you see them on successive images. Um, so these are very definitely uh, distinct individuals. So there's some tremendous war art uh, to, to to make up uh, to draw upon too. And I should say also as well as the art, there's poetry uh, uh, and um, and music also. So again, I. Um, completely unaware and still starting this work, but Kipling wrote a whole series of poems uh, about, well, really touching on the North Sea. It's called, um, uh, there's a little book called um, The Fringes of the Fleet, a series of poems about minesweepers and patrol boats and, and, and submarines and so on. Now, those poems were taken by Elgar and set to music, and that was then. Um, uh, performed to huge audiences all around the country. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the fact that they were really making uh, very popular works uh, uh, of art, really, uh, around the East Coast War Channels, but then really forgotten uh, thereafter. Basically, Kipling, after his own son was killed, felt that they shouldn't be making music uh, about the First World War and really pulled the plug on Elgar, uh, carrying on to do um, further performances. Right, I've really run out of time. Um, i just touch very briefly on what I'm doing with this project. Um, so the, one of the overriding aspects of uh, the, the War Channels is that the, the sites themselves, the wrecks on the seabed, the, the sites on the, on the shoreline, have been severed from their context and particularly from the documentation. There's actually quite a lot of documentation once you know where to look. Back to this bureaucracy, really, uh, of the First World War. Um, and where there is documentation, it tends to be split between lots of different archives. So I, the Hydrographic Office, the uh, Department for Transport, the National Archives, the uh, Imperial War Museum, the Greenwich National Maritime Muse Museum, all sorts of bits are broken up according to the different interests. Um, so that can be qu quite time consuming to, uh, to, to reconnect, but at the same time, we have a real revolution occurring in uh, accessibility of this material because so much is becoming online, either directly or because the catalogues are, are coming online. So it's a, it's a tremendously fruitful time. And really the technology that we're now having access to uh, is enabling us to recreate uh, this landscape, which is, is very exciting. There's also a revolution occurring in uh, imaging from underwater. So on, on the left-hand side, uh, a photograph from underwater. Now, photography underwater, only 10 years ago, used to be uh, a very difficult uh, process bef before digital because it was, uh, well, it was quite a lot of investment in the equipment. Uh, you would probably get rubbish photographs and you wouldn't know it until two weeks later when the film came back. So you didn't do it. It was, it was really a, a, quite a pain uh, unless uh, you had uh, a real specialism in it. Whereas now, digital cameras, digital video, uh, is really in the hands of, uh, of many people. It's very affordable. You get really quite good results very quickly. So well, the, the capacity to record sites with photography and then to do even cleverer things with photogrammetry underwater uh, is, is, is makes it really exciting. At the same time, we've had a, uh, another revolution happening in surveying underwater, where these images here are... are um, uh, multi-beam images, they, they use uh, their echo sounder images, 
but a, an incredible density of echo sounder returns allows you to pick up, uh, build up a very detailed topography uh, so that you can start to see these wrecks not as a, a little smudge, which you know, when I started, you would, geophysics meant, well, there's a smudge there, it might be something. Uh, now you can really see uh, these sites for what they are. You can see them really, they are monuments to the war, but monuments uh, of the shipbuilding industry. And the work I've been doing uh, for Historic England has been really um, kind of um, networked heritage. So I've been working in between lots of different people, and I've been working in particular with Citizen. I don't know, maybe, I don't know whether Citizen has been to speak to you, but Citizen is a, a coastal archaeology initiative being funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. That our interests overlap along the East Coast. I've been working with Citizen. They're encouraging people to do uh, um, uh, recording, uh, doing training courses and so on. I've also been working with the CBA's Homefront Legacy Project, which has got a, a strong focus on helping people to record First World War sites. And so um, normally they probably wouldn't have thought too much about marine, uh, but with a, a bit of a nudge, um, they, they, they can see we're, we're really making sure that the maritime aspects of the First World War are being incorporated into that overall record that, that they're developing. Also working with a, with a variety of others, National Archives, uh, National Trust, uh, and so on, to, to draw out this information and reconnect it. So, I will have a few concluding comments. I hope I've convinced you this evening that the conflict that took place over the East Coast War Channels should not be forgotten. The heritage assets associated with the War Channels can be understood in detail, but also as a coherent maritime landscape that is as significant as any other aspect of our military, industrial and social heritage. The War Channels also present an opportunity for people to engage with their maritime past as members of the public and coastal communities who have a fascinating history lying just off the coast. There's also a tremendous opportunity to seek to reintegrate not only the many different documentary sources with the material remains, but also to integrate research agendas across archaeology and history, across land and sea. Thank you very much. <laughs>